Hey everyone, really quick before we get into tonight's stories, I wanted to point you over to my Patreon and also memberships here on the channel. Over on Patreon, and if you are a member on the channel, I'm going to start doing monthly Q&As, and I'm also just going to start posting more video updates, things that I'm planning on doing this year, and just updates about the channel, updates about me, and everything like that, just in general throughout the 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 rest of this year. I want to be more active over there and I want to be more active for the members over here. And if you join on Patreon or if you become a member of the channel, you'll also get all the monthly Q&As and all the extra stuff as well as videos a day, two days, sometimes even four days in advance because I'm trying to schedule things much faster than I was last year to keep things caught up. That sounds like something you're interested in. Check out the tiers on Patreon and on the membership. Both of those links are down below. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you again, everyone, for listening. Let's get right into the stories. I was down in Clay County doing another fluff piece on the state fair when the murder happened not six blocks away. The Athanasia killer had struck again. In a furious funk over my bitter divorce and highly unwilling to go back home to face it, I decided that I was going to investigate. I'd once been the best. I'd once felt skilled and sharp. I'd once been young and a real journalist, but none of that mattered now in the area of entertainment media, endless spin, and oceans of straight-up lies. Here, though, was something meaty. That could not be denied. I couldn't have chosen a worse target for a midlife crisis. The Athanasia killer was purely a local legend kept alive by word of mouth in the South. Police and media alike never believed that the killings were done by the same person, and the city and state officials vehemently denied that there were serial killings at all. The first murder had been committed in 1809, you see, and the rest had been sporadic throughout the last two centuries. The victims had all been unrelated in any sense that investigators could see, and the similar methods had been blamed on copycats. Nobody paid it any mind until a local resident charged with murder in 1967 argued the possibility of one secretly long-lived man or a father and son pair of murders. And one. The defense lawyer coined the name the Athanasia Killer, and the Fury unanimously bought it. The local media described it as a farce justice and chalked it up to the defendant being white and judged by a jury of white men. The national media refused to cover any of it. But the murders continued. There I was, in Clay County, March 15, 2016, and the Athanasia killer had struck again. What were they expecting people to believe now, 207 years later? Was this a son, father, grandfather, great-grandfather thing, with the family members still committing murders in their 80s? No. The residents had now defaulted to that crazier notion. It was the same man, somehow unaging, perhaps a wanderer, living off the grid for fear of his immortality being found out. Perhaps the murders were how he was staying so young, in some arcane or occult fashion. That was nonsense, of course, but some part of me hoped it was true. If I busted a case like that wide open on the national stage, well, all my problems would disappear. My first stop was Mari's Apothecary. The eldest daughter of the store's namesake had been the most recent victim, and I found the pepper-haired older man standing behind the counter in his store, absently staring into space. Mari? He jumped, and then looked at me with vaguely haunted eyes. Can I help you? I showed him my credentials, pretending I was a bit more of a reporter than I truly was. I was hoping you were open to talking a bit, just seeing if you know anything about this Athanasia killer. He nodded then, his eyes sharp and focused. He's a bastard. You know him? I asked, detecting some layer of strangeness behind the man's reaction. No, 
He turned away quickly. Please, please go. I, I don't want to talk about this. I decided not to push the issue. Instead, I went back to my motel room and did some research on the victim. It turned out that she'd been quite the rebellious teenager, often in trouble with the law during high school. She graduated both to college and to greater risks. In the court records, it seemed Mari had paid great sums for legal defense and for bail on numerous occasions. I wondered if a small store could survive with expenses like that. In some sense, the Athanasia killer had done his family a sick sort of favor. My next stop was the sheriff's office, where a hard-eyed, white-haired war veteran glared me up and down from the other side of his desk. I inquired about Maury's eldest daughter, and his face instantly perked up, even though his eyes subtly did not. She was a wonderful girl, a light of this town for sure. It's a shame what that monster did to her. If I ever find him, I'll string him up. It's strange. There was that implied familiarity again, by referring to the killer as he or him directly, rather than something less specific. So, she never caused trouble? Sheriff shook his head. Nope. Delightful little church-going girl. I placed a few records on his desk. But it says here you were her arresting officer on numerous occasions. His fake smile fell hard. He put a hand down to his gun reflexively, but then visibly thought better of it. We don't speak ill of the dead here, son. It was a nice recovery, but I didn't believe him. Still, I knew when to back off. I bid a quick farewell and retreated. Now, noticing an odd spike in the number of law enforcement vehicles passing me on the streets, I decided to be a bit more careful. I checked out of my motel and drove out of town, with the sheriff casually driving a few cars back until he was satisfied I was leaving. Once deep in the backwoods, I turned right around and checked into a different motel. The previous victim had been killed about eight years before. This one had been a man of about 45, with a spotless record and glowing obituaries whose stories notably included no mention of anything within the span of his five years of unemployment prior to his death. The stories of his life just stopped with the loss of his job. I couldn't help but think of the sheriff's attitude towards speaking ill of the dead. What link did he have to a rebellious college girl? I visited his home, a ramshackle century-old dwelling with an overgrown yard, and I was surprised to find that it was still inhabited. A trashy but attractive blonde-haired girl in her late 20s opened the front door and shouted at me, thinking I was a prowler. Quickly, I introduced myself as a reporter, investigating the Athanasia killer, and she tensed unconsciously. What you want to know about him for? She asked, looking back over her shoulder into the depths of her house. Frowning, I asked quietly. Do we need to talk elsewhere? No, no, she said, looking wearily past me at the street before locking eyes on me. I don't want no trouble. Is he here? I whispered. Is he threatening you? She hesitated before saying, No? Then how would he find out that we talked? I won't tell anyone. He can't possibly know. Taking a step backwards, she shook her head. He'll know. I reached forward automatically to say something like, Wait, but she recoiled and horribly and shrieked. Whoa, I told her. I wasn't trying to hurt you. Red-faced and anxious, she held a hand to her heart while she tried to calm her breathing. It's not you. It's me. I'm sorry, just... Don't touch me. She took another few breaths and said, I can't talk to you. Wait, is it just you here? I asked, pressing just a tiny bit more. This is a big house just for you. It was my uncle's, she said, closing the door as she spoke. Sorry. 
Don't ask around about this. I stared at her closed front door for a few moments while trying to put two and two together. From my experience interviewing people, she definitely seemed traumatized by something. Had her uncle grown abusive during his many years of unemployment? She would have been very young back then, and that would explain her reaction to a stranger's touch. His death must have left her with this big house free of her abuser. Again, the Athanasia killer seemed to have done something of a favor through murder. But how could he have known about something as private as abuse? There's no way he was just some wanderer. The hairs on the back of my neck rose. I felt uncomfortably observed. Scanning her overgrown yard, I cautiously looked for threats, but saw none. Beyond the low wall that marked at the beginning of the sidewalk, a housewife in purple sweats stood talking on her phone, a dog leash in hand. I saw her glance my way and then quickly move on. I usually had good instincts for danger, but surely... No. I shook my head. This was a strange county, for sure, full of quiet, dark places under the trees and hidden familial miseries, but the Athanasia killer was not a housewife in purple sweats. Visiting a diner for a coffee and a moment to figure out my next move, I sat and stared out the window. The street was wide but slow, and scattered locals went about their business at a country pace. The whole region had been more or less gutted by economic looting in the hands of corrupt politicians and the high unemployment showed. The most made-up women around was waitresses serving coffee, and I heard a few haggard men at the counter stool promise they'd pay up next week. She just sighed, smiled, and said, Sure thing, dolls. Lost in thought, I'd forgotten to actually sip my coffee. The delay gave me a chance to notice the odd smell. Looking closer, I saw thicker bubbles than I was used to. Suspicious, I dabbed my pinky and touched the corner of my lip ever so slightly. My heart began beating faster as I felt a slight swelling. Poison. I wanted to jump up and warn the men at the counter, but they'd already taken gulps. I watched, starkly poised in my seat as nothing happened. Staring around in horror, I looked for any possible avenue of access to my coffee. I'd watched the waitress pour it, and I'd had it in my hands the entire time. The townsfolk outside went about their business, oblivious to the attempt on my life, except for one teenage boy on the sidewalk across the street. He noticed me, noticed him, and he immediately turned and walked off. It was then I began to question the myth itself. What if the Athanasia killer wasn't an immortal man at all? What if it was something worse? A spirit or an entity? With my mind open to new possibilities, I was willing to consider anything. What if this region had a guardian spirit that dealt brutally with threats to the well-being of its residents? No, wait. The cup. The cup could have been coated with poison. That would let the waitress pour the same coffee to everyone without me being the wiser. But who could have done it? Ma'am, excuse me. Is there anyone else working? The waitress frowned instinctively at the odd question, but then visibly remembered it was her job to smile. The cook. He just left on lunch a minute ago. Do you know him? I leapt up and ran outside without answering. Around the corner of the diner, I saw a chubby man in grubby white clothes removing his stained apron. At hearing my approach, he turned, saw me, widened his eyes, and then took off running. I roared at him and called up some of my long dormant endurance from my younger days. Just barely catching him as I stumbled, I gripped his shirt hard and demanded an answer. Why did you try to poison me? Are you the Athanasia killer? He shook his head forcefully enough to jiggle his jowls. Oh, God, don't say anything. Please, for the love of all this holy, pretend you didn't catch me. What? I glared murderously to show him I was done with vague games. Pretend to who? 
everyone, he whispered, terrified. To our left, three middle school aged children playing behind a chain link fence began to take notice. One pulled out a cell phone and began making a call. No! The cook shrieked. Fighting away with the strength of a desperate animal, he stumbled, jumped up despite his skinned hands, and ran with a speed that defied his form. I let him go, now intent on another lead. Crossing the cracked suburban pavement, I shouted at the kid with the phone. Who are you calling? He froze. Who the hell are you calling? I roared, hoping to intimidate him into blowing the conspiracy. Opening the chain link gate, I stormed over and grabbed his phone. My heart immediately sank and I felt like a fool. 911, of course. You saw a man getting beat up and you called the cops. The kids quivered in place. I handed the closest back his phone and held my hands up apologetically. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I'll just go now. It was my turn to run. What the hell was wrong with me? How could I have thought that middle schoolers were on some vast murderous conspiracy? A conspiracy of 200 years involving an entire county was unthinkable in its proportions, but that left either an immortal, avenging vagrant or some sort of guardian native spirit. Both of those possibilities made me feel just as nuts. On top of that, I was now thoroughly lost, and my phone had run out of battery charge due to my overuse of the map in a foreign place. The sheriff's car pulled up alongside me as I walked, and those hard, veteran eyes were upon me once more. What the hell are you still doing in town? I shrugged sheepishly. Sorry. And you're harassing kids? He asked. Get in. I'll take you back to your car. Then you're going to get out of here. I'm going to charge you with whatever I can. There was no other choice, really. I climbed into his passenger seat and listened graciously as he berated me about coming to other people's towns and causing trouble. I'm a sheriff, see, he continued. I take care of people around here, and guys like you don't make my job any easier. No, I don't like running people out of the county, but it's all part of the duty. Two hundred years, men like me been doing our duty. I... My hearing tuned out as I recalled a bronze plaque in the sheriff's office. Established 1805. Tuning back in, I hid any signs of anxiety and promised I'd head right out and give up on my fool's errand of an investigation. Throughout, all I could think was... A conspiracy. Didn't have to involve the entire county, at least not knowingly. Who do they call when things went wrong? An abused little girl, a stressed parent, wary housewives, scared kids playing in a yard. Why's your hand shaking like that, son? I stilted instantly. It was too late. He knew. He sighed unhappily, pulled the car over, and climbed out. Get out. I didn't move. What options did I have left? My phone had died and I was on some random, unfamiliar road. I doubted there would be help from the rundown houses on either side. He tapped his holstered gun. Get out of the car. Again, I had no choice. Breathing hard, I got out and stood as he pushed me toward a blind alley between two houses filled with tall grass and gravel. Don't do this. Idiot, he said fiercely. You brought this on yourself. I heard the sound of his gun being unholstered and drawn. I won't tell anyone, I, I swear. You're a reporter. I literally don't believe you. What if... A flash of desperate ideas occurred to me. What if I helped you? If you really want to protect this county, I've got a way better use for your duty. It's obvious to any outsider. My heart pounding in my chest a good 30 times before he finally said, I'm listening. I outlined the proposed partnership as best I could. 
with my skills, I can uncover the corruption as it happens. I can figure out who's taking bribes, who's selling out to the county, and what they're getting in exchange. That's how you help everyone at once. Don't take out criminal teenagers or abusive uncles. Take out the politicians that bankrupted the whole region, and maybe scare some people straight nationwide. Guarantee a few high-profile murders and a couple anonymous statements from the Athanasia killer about corruption will dramatically change how things are done. Scare them shitless. <laughs> he laughed darkly. You're a goddamn genius, son. The only problem is, it's all bullshit. The moment I let you walk away, you'll squeal, and a two-century civic institution here will go down the drain. No, I insisted, turning my face to see his gun. I promise. Promise ain't good enough. We gotta be bound greater than that. You gotta be implicated. That way I know you won't tell a soul. His terms weren't nearly as stomach-churning as I expected. Feeling a little bit like my problems were actually about to disappear, I returned to the diner for a coffee and sat with a tentative smile while my phone charged from the adjacent outlet. This was an unexpected turn of events, but my midlife crisis certainly could have turned out worse. I'd have a new job now, and a new duty that actually meant something. All it would take was one little sacrifice I was pretty sure I was willing to make. Dialing that familiar number for the last time, I said, Hey, it's me. I'm sorry I've been so combative about the divorce. I'll give you everything you want. I'll sign the papers today if you're willing to drive down and meet me where I'm working. No, I, I'm serious. Clay County. You willing to make that drive? Yeah? Good. I'll see you soon. I hesitated in response to her unexpected emotion. I did mean it, but not in the way she thought. I'm sorry things turned out this way, too. I hung up and sighed. My heart was heavy, but something excited me about the chance to make a difference again. With the media firmly locked down and kept a circus, exposing corruption like I'd done in my youth was no longer enough. I sighed again, this time happily. <sighs> Looks like you found the Athanasia killer after all. Across the table, sitting opposite of me, the sheriff reached out a hand while the cook and waitress looked on from behind the counter. Welcome to the team. Hey, you've reached Aaron and Katie. We aren't home right now, but leave us a message and we'll get back to you. Thanks. Katie, this is your mother. You didn't call last night and missed lunch with us today. I, I'm getting very worried. Please, call us back, okay? I listened to the message and looked at my wife's face, eyes glazed over and lips contorted. Her fingers fall limply from their grasp on my arm. My hands continue to shake even after I let go of her neck and she drops to the floor. Rage still burns through my veins while my heart continues to break. You're probably wondering what happened or why I find myself in the situation that I'm in. You also may already think that I'm a terrible person. Before you jump to any definitive conclusions, let me tell you the whole story of how I got here. Katie and I met in our early 20s, and she says it was love at first sight. She said she noticed me before I noticed her. We hung out after work one night, and that night turned into a relationship that lasted eight years. She entered my bed and never left it. We seldom left each other's side. We lived together right away, always hung out together, and we even worked together at a few jobs over the years. We had a wonderful five years or so until we started trying to have children. That's when her depression started. She would withdraw and go quiet. Her silence was like ice 
too cold for me to touch. I couldn't understand why things couldn't still be happy with just us. I know how badly she wanted to be a mother, but we still had each other. We had a connection we dreamt about for most of our young lives that some people never find. We started out with just the two of us, and we were happy. We could still be happy with just the two of us. After about two years, I made an appointment with a fertility clinic. We both needed to be checked to see what the holdup was. They were able to find that her fallopian tubes were ravaged with cysts. They had to be removed, right along with any hope or chance we had of our own biological child. Honestly, as terrible as it sounds to say, I'm glad we went. Not because of the result, but because they were able to find a problem that Katie had and fix it. I tried to be there for her, tried to sympathize and help her cope. The upcoming winter season didn't seem to be helping either. We tried marriage counseling and individual therapy for her. I even spoke to a few adoption lawyers to ask about the process to give us options. It's not what we... It's not what she had planned, but I always support her and her dreams. If she wanted a baby and I couldn't give it to her, then... This was the next best option to me. She wouldn't hear of it, of course. Adoption was like a dirty word to her. She actually cringed when I first said it to her. She couldn't handle the idea of raising someone that she didn't nurture and grow in her womb. Forget about saving another child's quality of life. She was too narcissistic for that. It'll only be disappointment to them, Aaron. If I don't feel that connection, they'll sense that, and that's not fair to them. You raise a child for the majority of its life, and that's fine. However, when they get to a certain age, they want to know all about their birth parents. They want to know everything about them. You have no idea how many birth parents pop up wanting to know their kids. And wouldn't you know, it always seems to happen after they turn 18, she would say. No matter how I went about it, it always ended in tears. Nights on the couch, in the silence of a frostbitten atmosphere. She seemed to have started to come around after a couple of months. I came home and found her listening to music and swirling around the kitchen tiles in her socks. She'd painted her fingernails a metallic baby blue, in honor of winter time, she told me excitedly. To me, her painting her nails was a great thing. If she's pampering herself, she was happy, she was present, she was my Katie again. I couldn't help but smile when I saw the woman that I'd married so many years ago. She even told me she joined a social media group about infertility and loved the support she was getting. It gave her strength to hear other people's struggles and get us to share our own people who truly understood. I was happy for her. I wanted to tell her that I was there for her too, and I also understood that if she shared with anyone, it needed to be me, her partner. I was the other person sitting in the chair when the doctor told us. I had visions and dreams crushed too. She didn't need to hear that right now though. And right now she was happy, so I was happy. She certainly would get support. Her phone would constantly vibrate with notifications and messages, sometimes at all hours of the night. I figured, well, it's a big group, and it's not the same time everywhere in the world. She must have it set to notify her every time someone posts something or likes something of hers. She needs support from women right now who understand. Katie took it very seriously. I'd hand her her phone when it was near me and went off. She'd give me looks. Looks like a kid gives his peeking neighbor during a test before he covers his paper so he can't copy. Hey, babe. She said, looking at me with dancing eyes. You know, some of the women of the group are talking about picking a weekend and doing a spa meet and greet. To put more people in contact with each other and for women to get pampered and cry on each other and things like that. It's not like we have to find anyone to watch our kids. She tried to joke with a pained smile. Does this sound like something you'd like to go to with me? I knew if I hesitated too long, it was going to be bad one way or another. I would have to take off work. 
God knows where this meeting place was going to be. The chances that it would have been in our city, hell, our state even, were slim to none. Honestly, all the crying would be so unsettling and awkward for me. Yeah, I loved my wife. She's the only one I've ever loved in my life. However, infertility was already something that I'd made peace with and accepted months ago. I couldn't bring the level of understanding to that table that was needed for this. Uh, would you like me to go, honey, or do you need to be with your new women friends? I honestly want to go and support you if you need me, though it'd be super awkward if I was the only man there. There are men in this group, right? When I said this, she tried to stifle a giggle by biting her lower lip. She shook her head no and then burst into giggles, apologizing between breaths. No, really, no. There's just a couple, and those are mainly joint accounts. Aaron, you don't have to go. I will totally be okay and understand, but I think this will really help me. Besides, this will give us a chance to miss each other. I'm sure I'll come back a refreshed woman. I won't think you're unsupportive or uncaring. It turned out that it was two weeks away and the next stayed over. From where we were located, it would only take her three and a half hours by car. She'd have no problem getting there and having her weekend and then driving back home when she woke up on Monday. I was going to surprise her by making a meal plan and rearranging the living room while she was gone. I wanted to take care of all the little tasks she nagged me about, but I never got to while I had the time to myself. The time came for her to leave, and I sent her off with a kiss and my favorite t-shirt. I told her, you wear this on your saddest cry day. I want to be the one to wipe your tears away, even when I can't be there. Again, she got a pained look on her face, but she shook it off with a smile. Thank you for understanding. I'll miss you, and I'll call you every day, she told me. I kissed her and then she left, driving off into her weekend of healing. After picking up and cleaning the floors, I was almost ready to start rearranging our living room, but I'd been putting off cleaning the dust off the ceiling and fans for way too long. Neither of us really wanted to do it, but I was the taller one, so the task generally fell to me. She would be happy. She'd be proud that I did it when she came home. A refreshed Katie coming home to a refreshed house. She called at around 9 p.m. to let me know that she'd got there all right and that she missed me already. She blew my phone kisses after a knock at the door. Hey, that's my friend. I'll call you in the morning, okay? I love you, she said before getting off the phone. I hoped this would help her and help us be what we once were. Around the middle of the next day, Saturday, she informed me that her phone was dying. I looked at the counter and saw both of our wall chargers lying there. So I called her and told her to just use the car charger, but not to leave it in the car while it was turned off because A, someone could steal her phone, and B, it could kill her battery. I missed her, and I would do so, but I really didn't want to have to drive three hours to jump her car just to drive home again. She didn't know cars, and you can't always depend on strangers, especially in another state, even if it was only a few hours from home. She promised me that she would be fine, that she couldn't talk long, but she loved and missed me like crazy. For the rest of the day when I called, it would go to voicemail. I was just thankful she was able to tell me what had happened, so I wasn't worrying when I suddenly couldn't reach her. It was really thoughtful for her to let me know so I wouldn't lose my mind with worry. I mean, she had never met these people before, they could have been anyone. Who knows the conclusions my mind would have jumped to. I should have made sure she packed that charger, I thought at the time. I sent her a, have fun, our bed's cold without you, text from work. I wanted my message of love to be the first thing she saw when her phone had more battery life. I couldn't wait to smell her hair again. Before long, it was Monday, the day she was supposed to come home. We chattered excitedly on the phone while she packed. Before long, I rushed off the phone to get last minute things ready for her arrival. Our home missed her as much as I did, I think. It was so much darker without her there, the emptiness swallowing me. I'd be glad to have her in my arms. I bought some reunited and it feels so good alcohol for us to enjoy and then went home and waited. She walked through the door and I gave her a hug that lifted her off the ground. She did look different. I couldn't place it, but it was different. It almost 
had the glow of her being centered, finally able to find some peace with herself. I was glad for that. We'd both needed that for her. Seeing her so rejuvenated made me feel the same, and we relished our time together. We were so wrapped up that she completely forgot to say anything about the house. It's okay, though. She's here now, and that's all I've ever wanted. The holidays came and went with Katie, seeming like a bulb growing brighter every day. I was thankful she was able to turn it into positivity. For some childless couples, the holiday season can be a big slap in the face. Her group even did a secret Santa, and one of the members sending Katie a very name-brand, very expensive, very out-of-our-budget gift. I was happy for her. She deserved nice things. She really lucked out on her secret Santa. One day I got a call when Katie was in the shower. It was her mom saying that her father was having some chest pains, so she was taking him to the hospital. I relayed the message to her and she rushed out. I handed her some clothes, her purse, and the keys. I lovingly told her to keep me updated on her way out. I hoped that my father-in-law was going to be okay. I would have gone with her, but I had work in a little over an hour. I heard a buzzing and looked around our room to see where it was coming from. It sounded like a phone. I checked my phone. It wasn't me. I got on the floor to peer under the bed, and there is Katie's phone. It probably fell out of her purse when I picked it up and handed it to her. I couldn't help myself. I unlocked her screen, and what I saw made the color drain from my body and curled my stomach instantly. Katie, I had so much fun this weekend. I can't believe how amazing everything was. I didn't even want to sleep. It's crazy how well things went. Now we know. Alan, oh my god, me too. I felt so comfortable with you. Three and a half days, it's like we've been together for years. I think this group is going to have monthly meetings if I can manage. We've been talking for so long. And then we met and it was like an instant connection. I can't wait to see you again. I knew I loved you and then it was confirmed for me 100% when I saw you. I can't wait to meet your son. <sighs> me too. It's all I can think about. I know that my kid will love you just as much as I do. You are perfection, the, the total package, a trophy to be shown and proud of. To say you're hot would be an insult. You're beautiful in every way. Now that we know it's real, you have to work on your end of the situation. I won't be played for chump. If you do love me and want to keep me, you need to do some decision making. This isn't a game. And this is not a fairy tale. If your husband makes you happy, then I'm out. But if you want me, do the work. Text me when it's okay to text back. I love you. Gorgeous. I read the messages over and over again until the words blurred through my tears. My mind raced to try and think of something, anything to make this look different from what it obviously was. She knew when she asked me to come with her that I would say no. That's why she made it so easy for me. We had never taken separate getaways before. All of our vacations were always taken together. She had changed. She was happy. And now I knew that it was because of him. She'd healed all right. Healed herself right into someone else's family. She reacts like I say the word abortion instead of adoption, and now she can't wait to meet his son? <laughs> this is too much. She thought that I wouldn't understand her healing process, and she was fucking right. There was nothing to make me understand this. When was she going to tell me? Was she going to tell me? Would I have just come home one day to a note saying, Adios, Aaron. It's been fun. I raced to the trash and threw up. I love turning to bile in my throat and spewing out. All of her words, all of the love, all the plans and promises turned to poison in my heart. 
Every memory a lie, every struggle unfelt by her. Did she even want children with me? Did she ever... Did she ever even love me? What was the point of all this? Every single question branched off into five more questions, attacking my mind like a murder of crows. I lit a cigarette on the way to my car, drove to the corner store, and bought a lot of beer. I never drink, but if there was ever a time for it, now was that time. I chugged one in the parking lot and opened another for the ride home. My father always said that the road to a man's self-destruction always began with a woman. And it looked like he was right, I thought, as I threw a crushed can out of the window. I lit another cigarette as I pulled into the driveway and saw her car there. Without thought or care, I drank two more before going inside, lit cigarette and all. She was sitting there on our bed with her phone laying in front of her with a screen lit up. Her eyes widened when she saw me smoking in the house. She opened her mouth to say something, but then quickly closed it, realizing the shots weren't hers to call here. She wasn't upset or crying. She just looked numb. I've never wanted to hit a woman in my life, but my hand throbbed with the desire to. I rubbed my hand on my jeans to try and disperse the energy. I loom over her and shout. You can tell Alan that it's safe for him to message you now. He can message you anytime he wants, and it's not my problem anymore. You've never been who I thought you were. The past eight years were all a lie, I said as my words turned to blubbering tears. I didn't want to give her the satisfaction of seeing my heart break. I couldn't help it. Through all my anger and all my hate, I still saw her there sitting on the bed. She looked so small and lost. All I wanted to do was hold her. That wouldn't happen, though. Not ever again if I could help it. She finally cried and apologized. She promised that she would end it and block him and get rid of social media entirely to work on us. She said she wanted to be a better wife and got lost. She said she got mixed up in the situation and became too big for her to get out. She needed help. She actually had the gall to tell me that she was glad she got caught and now I could help her get out of it. She said she never stopped loving me and never loved him. I felt neglected by you, Aaron. I felt like I lost you and myself when we couldn't have kids. I thought I'd found myself and figured out life, but I was wrong. I went to leave you, but I couldn't do it. Aaron... I will do anything to fix this. We can come out of this stronger and with a better understanding of each other. We spent an entire week apart, me taking a trip of my own out of state to clear my head. She went to my parents and cried to them about what she'd done. She'd apologized for hurting their son and asked for their forgiveness, figuring it would eventually lead to mine. Though manipulative and inconsiderate to my parents' mental health, it worked. She picked me up from the airport, and again, I hugged her so hard I lifted her off the ground. We went home and reconnected. We really talked, for hours into the night, and then again when we woke up the next day. We'd worked a lot out, and decided what we needed from each other was to get past this and not let it ruin us. The only thing I asked of her was to block his number from her phone and to never, under any circumstances, positive or negative, have contact with him again. This was my time to heal, and that was the only way I was going to be able to do it. I wouldn't forgive her twice. Though I didn't tell her at the time, she did ruin us. I saw Alan's picture next to his messages, so I knew his face. Every time I would go to kiss her or touch her, I'd see his face like a ghost. Alan making her laugh, him kissing her forehead, him making her sweat. I hated it. I wanted to hate her, but I couldn't. 
despite everything, she was still the woman I loved and always would be, even if I did leave her. We would get through this. A part of me already died when I found out what she did. Maybe that part will grow back stronger. Better. A few more months went by. Valentine's Day came with no issue. I was nervous about it, but Katie tried her best to make sure it was a good day for me. And for us. I started to see the ghost of Alan less and less. Katie was turning into the woman I married again. It was terrible that she needed to get back to that, but as long as I had her, we could work it out. She would never leave me again, she promised. She deleted social media as promised, and Alan's number remained blocked. My heart started to slowly heal. I was well on my way in love with her again. Not like nothing happened, but like we didn't let it break us. I stopped checking up on her so much. She felt terrible about it and seemed to punish herself more any day that I could ever could. So we let it fade into the past. She'd never leave me again, she promised. Hey, Aaron, can you please look at my phone? I think I have some sort of virus, she asked me concerned. I laughed at her and joked. You know how you get that, don't you? Too much freaky peaky. What kind of sick shit you've been looking up? She slapped my arm, giggling her way into our kitchen. No! Come on, I can't get any of my pictures to load, and I wanted to send some to my mom. You're off today. Please? I told her I would help her and give me an hour with her phone. I'd back up her pictures and factory reset it if the problem was too bad. I transferred her pictures over to the computer just in case. Then I unplugged her phone and looked through her messages to make sure she didn't lose any important numbers or pictures if it reset I went to text settings to see if there were any locked or starred messages with pictures of us. I saw an option on the phone that said blocked messages. With very wary but overwhelming curiosity, I opened the folder. There were so many. All from Alan. Haven't heard from you. Sorry about how I act sometimes. You know I love you. I just think that when two people want to be together, they should do anything they can to do so. It's hard for me to imagine the situation you're in at home, and I just get frustrated. Tell me you're thinking of me. I love you, toots. I'm so lucky to have you. I thought of you last night before going to bed, but that's nothing new. You know how hard you make me. I just want you to know that no matter how mad I get at you, I can never stop loving you. And I'll never turn my back on you. You look beautiful today. I love talking to you. It's been the best part of my day for months. Good morning. You're rocking it today, babe. They went on and on like that, and my mind snapped. The frail bandages holding my fragile heart and mentality all fell away. I looked over to her across the room. My breath was coming out in faster and bigger huffs than my face was turning red. She looked at me confused. Before she finished her word, I was out of the chair in front of her. The time for words has ended now. I only asked you for one thing. Just one fucking thing. I stood up to leave and she launched about the couch, throwing herself on me. Aaron, please, I don't understand. We've come so far. I've worked so hard. Why would I do that just to talk to him again? I haven't been talking to him. Don't go anywhere. I know I fucked up last year, but I won't do that again. Her sobs grew louder. No way. There's no way that she gets to be the one to cry here. She doesn't get to feel anything but shame right now. I'm the one that should have been crying. But of course, everything was always about her. I couldn't even have feelings without her trying to steal them so she could end up being the victim. I had to stop it. Get her to be quiet. I slammed my hand over her mouth, but she still sobbed, soaking my hand in snot and tears. Her wails grew louder and louder, repeating the same words over and over. It was as if she thought the more she said them, the more I would have believed her. 
The only things that I do believe are that I can't bounce back from this twice. That I can't live with her and live without her, as the saying goes. My hand dropped from her mouth to her throat, the other coming up to meet it. Now, it was my turn to feel. I cried and sobbed, and I squeezed my hands tighter and tighter. Fragmented wedding vows grunted out through my teeth as I heaved with my tears. I wanted my face to be the last thing she saw as the life faded out of her eyes. Her wails turned to whimpers until finally barely any sound could escape at all. To death do us part, my darling, and I promise I won't be far behind. So this is how we got here. My mother-in-law's voice on the home answering machine, her daughter turning colder by the minute on the floor, my hands shaking and my sides sore from the sobs. The light of my life is gone. Why did she have to do this again? She always said she was born to me, my wife, and that she would die for me. Well, here we are. She ended up being true to her word in one sense, at least, through all of this. I checked the block list again and see a new message from 18 minutes ago. I love the way you smell, it read. Enough of this shit. I hit the call button on the message. It rings and rings until finally a woman picks up. Before I have any room to say anything, she starts yelling at me. You have to be some kind of stupid to continue to call after all that you've done, Katie. The woman said my wife's name as if it was disgusting on her tongue. She continues. As far as his son and I are concerned, you might as well have been driving the car that killed him. Do you know he had messages set up pre-scheduled to send to you for two months? It's nice to know you have messages from him after he's dead, but what about his son, you heartless slut? She was going on and on, hysterical with fury. I tuned her out and hung up the phone without a word. I think really think about what she said. She said the words killed in pre-scheduled messages. Katie was telling the truth. She hadn't contacted him. This also explained why he still went on as if they were together. It really was over. She was mine again. Oh my god. I run to the bathroom, rifle through the medicine cabinet, and grab a bottle. I don't plan to call the police or turn myself in. Surely the neighbors heard the noise and called them already. I don't know if I'll have the courage to take the contents of this bottle. For now, I'm going to snuggle up to my sweetheart. I'll hold her for as long as I can and not let go. I'll hold her and smell her hair as I wait for the knock to come at the door. They can try, but they'll never let her go. She'll never leave me again, she promised. Till death do us part, sweetheart. I was not planning on facing my potential demise when I started on my stroll that chilly late December's night. My intention was no more than finding something to quench my very pregnant wife's cravings along with some desperately needed solitude for myself. I don't mean to sound insensitive by any means. I do love my Christine very much. I think I fell for her within the first few moments of the initial meeting that brought us together. I'd been alone for many years before friends took it upon themselves to arrange the blind date. I had never cared for such things, but even an introvert such as I could be consumed with loneliness from time to time. She was truly a delight to be around, and it amazed me to find that we had so much in common. I consider myself to be of fairly unique tastes, and it's always been difficult for me to form relationships. My small circle of friends had been in my life for what felt like centuries sometimes, but I never could have predicted they would be the ones to introduce me to my soulmate. We married within mere months of being together. 
I worried we were rushing things a bit, that perhaps we had not yet outgrown our honeymoon phase, but I had never been more happy in my life. Over the years, our love for each other never grew stale or predictable, and when she became pregnant, we were overjoyed at the thought of bringing a new member into the family. Unfortunately, my poor Christine endured some complications over the last few months, and has found herself mostly bedridden. I've done my best to be the loving and supportive husband she's needed over this troubling time, but this has left little room for me to be alone with my thoughts. A necessity for the introverts of the world. So, when she had a late night craving, I was more than happy to take it upon myself to head out for a spell. She was hesitant to let me leave as it was getting late and surely few stores would still be open. I assured her that I'd be able to track something down, but she practically begged me to stay home. There had been a rash of killings as of late in our humble little town, but the victims had primarily been brunette women. Four dark-haired ladies and three men of no distinct pattern, to be precise. Our local sheriff feared a serial killer was at large, but I presumed he had just watched entirely too many crime shows. Perhaps I was too quick to dismiss his suspicions, as well as proving a little too eager to escape the house for a bit, but I understood Christine's concerns. I promised I would keep my phone handy should she need me before I kissed her on the forehead and made my way out into the night. It may have been wiser for me to arm myself with something more intimidating than my trusty pocket knife, but I wasn't overly concerned. This wouldn't be the first time I had braved the brisk night air for a midnight snack with my love, and I'm sure it wouldn't be the last. So, I left out for my stroll, leaving the snow-covered car parked. It would have obviously made my trip faster had I chosen to drive, but I wasn't the biggest fan of driving on slippery roads. Plus... The walk would allow much more time for me to enjoy a bit of solitude. Once I was far enough away from the house, I lit a cigarette. My wife wasn't exactly fond of the habit that had been a part of my life since my teen years, but that wouldn't stop me from sneaking in a few when I got the chance. This was another thing that was far more rare as of late. There are worse things people do behind their spouse's back, so I wasn't exactly burdened with guilt over it. She does have an uncanny sense of smell, though. I always keep hand sanitizer and a bottle of cologne in my jacket pocket for such occasions. Normally, on nights like these, she'd be too distracted by whatever goodies I brought her to be concerned with whether or not I'd snuck in a smoke or two. Within 15 minutes, I was pushing through the door of the gas and sip. It was a decent little convenience store, which they had all decked out in Christmas flair. I toured the snack aisle while the little drummer boy echoed from the speakers above my head. I always looked forward to hearing the festive music in the stores this time of year, though many would just have the droning elevator-style tunes for ambient background music. Fortunately, my old buddy Eduardo, behind the counter, made sure to provide songs from his own playlists. Many gas stations wouldn't provide for their guests brief visitations, but I think Ed did it more for himself than anyone else. There were only two other people in the store at this hour. An older gent scratching lottery tickets up front, and another guy in the back sporting a brown hoodie and a thick winter coat. I couldn't see his face, but he just appeared to be aimlessly window shopping. I couldn't help but wonder if he was just wanting the place to clear out so he could pull a gun on Ed, but he'd only have himself to blame when my friend would inevitably draw the 12 gauge he kept under the counter. I shouldn't presume anyone's ill intent, just because they seem to be trying too hard to be inconspicuous, but... The world has become a crazy place. Finding nothing to fit my wife's cravings just right, I just delved into the snack cakes. I dropped my arm full of Twinkies, Ding Dongs, and Donuts on the counter, to which Abe gave a chuckle. <laughs> you want some insulin to go with that? He laughed. May not hurt to grab a shot or two, I replied with a smile. Is Chris about ready to pop? Ed asked. <laughs> you have no idea, I laughed. We had been frequenting this gas station for some time, so Ed was more than familiar with us. He'd even been by the house on the rare occasion he had a day off, but he stayed extra busy as of late since his father retired. The store was family-owned, but he hoped to be able to hire a few more hands after the first of the year. God knows the poor guy needs a break. You know that guy? I asked, nodding my head to the man in the brown hoodie who still stalked the rear aisle. Never seen him before, Ed replied. 
handing me the double bag sack of goodies. Just be safe, men, I said. No worries, brother, my friend said with a wink, knocking the barrel of a sawed-off shotgun against the back of the counter. I just gave him a smile as I took the bulging plastic bag from him. Merry Christmas, Ed, I said with a wave while I headed to the door. Back at you, man, he replied. The cold breeze practically smacked me in the face when I pulled the door open. It was almost stiflingly hot in the gas station, and I'd almost forgotten how chilly it was outside. Though I was sure the snacks I had gathered would suit my own sweet tooth, I hated the idea of disappointing Christine. Even with how miserable her advanced pregnancy had been, she rarely asked for anything. The only other store that may be open at this hour was a good couple of miles away. Perhaps I would take that drive tonight after all. Having decided to return to my house to grab the car, I turned my back to the gas and sip and began my trip. I figured I'd check back in on my wife before heading out back into the cold, though I was sure she would try and talk me out of it. Still, I'd be damned if I was going to let her down, so my mind was made up. I dug out my earbuds out of my jacket pocket and queued up my own Christmas playlist to guide my way home. Perhaps it wasn't the best choice to tune out the world around me. I likely should have been paying more attention to my surroundings as I traversed the snowy sidewalk to my festive melody. It was my own fault that I didn't even see it coming. Whatever it was, it struck me across the back of the head and immediately knocked me unconscious. I can't be sure how long I was out for, but when my eyes opened back up, I found I was strapped down to a frigid metal table in a darkly lit room. Leather belts were buckled around each wrist and ankle, and my coat and shirt had been removed. It was freezing, to the point that I could see my shaky breath exiting my mouth, while my heart thumped so hard I could see my chest bouncing. After a moment, fluorescent lights flickered on above me, causing my eyes to burn slightly. I wasn't sure if anyone else would be out this late, a voice said from behind where I lay. I was about to settle for the old guy before you walked in, he continued as he strolled around the metal table. He pulled down the brown hood to reveal a thin face with dark beard stubble. I'd say he was maybe early thirties at most. Thick, shaggy hair, long, pointy nose, pale skin, and immaculate white teeth from what I could tell. He appeared taller now than he had at the convenience store, but that could just be the effect of my being strapped down to a slab close to his waistline. I didn't want to grab the guy behind the counter. He'd likely be missed. Plus, the security cameras would surely catch me dragging him out. i never seen you before, though, he said nonchalantly as he unlocked the large closet in the back of the room. The double doors opened up to reveal an assortment of especially nasty-looking bladed weapons. Some long and curved, some short and serrated, but all of them looked sharp enough to slice through a Thanksgiving turkey with little to no resistance. Were I to wager a guess, my body would be taking the place of the traditional birdie in this case. Ain't as easy to snatch up folks this time of year, the stranger who was now slipping out of his padded coat said. May have to move to a more populated town soon, you know? He continued, unzipping the hoodie. I try to keep moving. Ain't too smart to linger anywhere for too long with hobbies like mine. He laid the hoodie over the desk that sat against the rear wall while reaching for the apron that hung on the inside of the cabinet door. Couldn't resist trying to get one more before the end of the year. He tied the apron lace around his waist before studying the contents of his well-armed closet. Being Christmas and all, I'll show you a bit of compassion. What do you say? He asked, turning to face me for the first time since our, well, introduction. You want it quick and easy, or you want me to take my time a bit? He was speaking as casually as if he was asking what side I wanted to go with my burger. Can I... think about it for a while? I asked, shrugging as much as I could while strapped to the cold-ass table. <sighs> That's a big no, partner, but I can't blame you for trying, he replied, bursting out laughing at the end. <sighs> Worth a shot, I sighed. So... He continued, drying his eyes with the back of his hand, still chuckling slightly. What's it gonna be? I adjusted my head as much as I could to look at the man in the face. 
His dark eyes had a certain hunger behind them. I thought I may attempt to stall him a little, at least give myself some extra time to come up with some semblance of a plan to get out of this. I, uh, can't say I'm pressed for time or anything, I replied. I'm sure my wife's going to be worried by now, but I assume you're not planning on letting me head home anytime soon. Of course, I imagine it's safe to say that taking your time a bit, as you said, I waved my finger in air quotes, which were far less effective while strapped down, would be a good deal more painful for me, though. I would like to think far more satisfying for you. On the flip side, I continued, what you call quick and easy is sure to kick my bucket sooner than I'd like, so... Are you gonna drone on all night? He whined, interrupting my train of thought. Well, it's a relatively big decision, I reasoned. Jesus Christ, just give me an answer or I'm gonna choose for you. He belted out. He was glaring at me with his hands on his hips and his head tilted to the side. It felt similar to the time I accidentally chucked the baseball through the windshield of my dad's truck. That I'm not angry, just disappointed sort of look. The idea of someone I presumed to be a serial killer being let down by my actions almost made me feel like giggling a bit. Well? He yelped. I, I don't know, I retorted. What would you choose? Huh, he said, instantly calming from his previously aggravated state while forming an expression that almost resembled a poor attempt at a Robert De Niro impersonation. Guess I never really thought about it from the other side of the table. He grabbed the armrest of the chair which rested in front of the desk and glided it across the floor to my bedside. He rubbed the back of his neck while taking a seat next to where I lay. I mean, I get what you're saying now, he said. It really is a tricky situation. Right? I replied, feebly shrugging again. Sure, quick wouldn't hurt nearly as bad. Wouldn't really do a whole lot for me either, to tell you the truth, he continued, showing almost exaggerated effort on his face. Slow would definitely not be a walk in the park for you, but I'd sure as shit have a good time. He was rubbing his hand across the stubble on his chin. That way is a hell of a lot more tiring, too. It's been a long friggin' day. We glared at each other, each of us puzzling over both sides of the equation. It's a conundrum, he said, shaking his head with a half-smile. A dilemma, even, I remarked. The room fell silent as we considered our options. Though I wouldn't say I was in a particular rush to come up with whatever would qualify as a mutually beneficial selection, I would imagine we had a differently desired outcome in mind. As I lay there, considering my next move, I became aware of the lump in my back pocket. The stranger apparently had no thought to remove my wallet as he stripped down my upper half in preparation for the night's activities, and it would appear he also had neglected my trusty pocket knife, which felt like it was still laying snugly in the other pocket. Flip a coin? I suggested, breaking the silence in hopes of distracting the pondering man for a moment. Now that is a good idea, he exclaimed, holding his pointer finger up as though he were chanting Eureka. He quickly got to his feet and practically sprinted the small distance between the chair and his jacket. He rummaged around in his pockets while I gently slid my left butt cheek in the direction of my leather-bound wrist. I'm gonna say, heads we make it a quickie, and tails we go all night. What you think? He asked, spinning it in place to look me in the eye. I was attempting to be as discreet as possible, but I was almost caught red-handed when he turned. Luckily, he appeared to be too distracted to notice what I was attempting to do. Sounds fair, I said, tilting my head. He grinned like a madman and went back to digging through his coat and hoodie. Before I felt secure enough to get back to my quest, the man dropped his hands to his side dejectedly and turned his face toward me again. No coins. God damn it, he said, shaking his head side to side. Well, shit, I agreed. He glanced around the room as though there were a secret stash of quarters he had neglected. Be right back, he stated before heading toward the door he had previously entered through. Don't go anywhere, I heard him chuckle as he darted up to an apparent stairway. 
With the door ajar, I could make out the sounds of the odd individual rummaging through drawers, seemingly right at the top of the flight of stairs. I wasted no time in continuing my efforts to free my knife from my pants. Finally, I gripped onto it with my fingertips while I heard items heavy and light scattering across the floor above. I pulled my whip in a choice free and flipped the blade open. I slipped it between the strap and my wrist and quickly began carving through the belt. Just as a jubilant yell echoed from above, followed by excited footsteps thundering down the steps, I managed to break my left hand loose. I gripped my knife underhanded and prepared to strike as soon as he got close enough. When something happened, I don't think either of us saw coming. Given the fact the cold steel table was propped upon I was facing away from the entrance of the room, I can only speculate what occurred based on the noises I heard. The hammering footfalls seemed to come to a halt as soon as the man hit the threshold of the room I occupied. It was a loud snapping sound, followed by the beginning of an F-bomb leaving the man's lips accompanied by a screeching oof. I then found myself able to view the shaggy dark hair of the man as he slid face first across the floor to my right with a shiny nickel rolling toward the cupboard full of nasty carving tools. The complete absence of anything audible afterwards led me to conclude that he knocked himself out cold. I took the opportunity to unbuckle the belts around my other wrists and ankles before heaving the man from the ground to the table he'd previously occupied. Unfortunately, my cutting through the wrist strap rendered me unable to buckle all of his limbs, so I simply sliced a few tendons in his forearm while he slept. I managed to locate my shirt and jacket, which had been tossed in the plastic-lined floor in the corner of the room. Once I felt the warm blood make its way through my extremities again, I ducked through the stranger's jacket in hopes of finding a phone to call my wife. I could only assume my own device was still on the side of the road I was abducted from, but... I had committed Christine's number to memory since our first official date. Not only was my search successful in locating a phone, but I also recovered a set of keys. I had absolutely no clue where I was at the moment, but I should be free to use whatever vehicle these operated when I was done here. With this device in hand, I was finally able to check on what time it was. Seeing that it was a little after four in the morning, I had little doubt that my love would be bordering on frantic at my delayed return home. Even though I was calling from an unfamiliar number, she answered within two rings, and as predicted, she was bordering on tears when she heard my voice. I informed her of what happened and assured her I'd be home as soon as I was able. Even though I had little choice in the matter, I still apologized for not being able to track down what she had a hankering for. Still, I promised I would bring her home the heart of a dark-haired man who now lay strapped on the cold metal table. She'd been craving nothing but brunette women for a while now, but she still sounded delighted when I promised to bring her the tasty snack momentarily. It wasn't always easy being married to a werewolf, but my own unique talents paired with hers quite nicely. Even more so, her pregnancy rendered her unable to hunt for the last few months. I must say, the wealth of tools I now had access to would make things much easier for me. Though I was steeled with my trusty pocket knife, it's always a bitch to get through the sternum especially on these cold nights when I can barely feel my fingertips. I'll be home soon, baby, I told Christine, making kissing noises into the phone while the man bound to the table was moaning himself back to awareness. He spilled a mass of profanities and grunts when he realized that we'd switched positions. I pulled his apron over my head and tied the cord around my waist while he writhed and shouted. So... I said, interrupting his alarmed curses when he realized he could not control his left arm. Would you like it quick and easy, or should I take my time, I asked. His reply was not very helpful, as it only concerned the variety of things he would like to lodge between my buttocks. Fortunately, while the stranger continued to rage on, I noticed the light reflecting off the shiny nickel that lay at the base of the tool chest. Huts, I exclaimed, retrieving the coin from the floor. Looks like quick and easy for the win. I continued before reaching for his phone once more. I made a quick search for a festive playlist to provide a joyful soundtrack for the work ahead. I smiled as I shuffled through the vast menu of Christmas tunes with the knowledge I'd be back at my wife's loving arms very soon. A quick thank you to Absinthe Alice, Amethyst, Amit, Caroline, Christine Smith, 
Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, if in doubt, let out, Karen Parrott, Kat, Lindsay Pruitt, Melissa Berwick, Milla, Nikki Parsons, and the new Ongo 24. Thanks for your support.